I'm going to talk about what I think is a very strong candidate for the most effective weapon of World War II in this video, which has been sponsored by Audible, but more of that later. Now, you may make a case, and I, I can see it would be a very strong case, for the most effective weapon of World War II being, well, those, those two bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, because just two bombs, uh, largely on their own, forced an entire Axis power that had shown up to that point very little uh, desire to surrender, to surrender. And yes, you would have a point, but I'm going to limit the scope of this video and talk just about weapons used in battle by soldiers against other soldiers. And the weapon I'm going to suggest it was was the crocodile. No, obviously not the animal, I mean the flame-throwing tank uh, that the British developed uh, using the, uh, as a basis the Churchill tank. Now, this was not the first flame-throwing tank, not by any means, or even the first flame-throwing vehicle. It wasn't even the first flame-throwing Churchill. There was an earlier ver version uh, of the flame-throwing Churchill called an Oak, uh, O-K-E, after the commander who developed it. And uh, this was sort of tested in action in that three of them uh, went ashore at uh, Dieppe in that ill-fated raid, but uh, in common with the other tanks, um, they didn't find their way up the Shingle Beach, because Shingle just loads and loads of, of round pebbles up in mounds, uh, is, is not uh, something that uh, tanks can manoeuvre up a steep slope of, and so they just dragged Shingle towards the sea and gradually buried themselves, and so they got nowhere. So the weapon wasn't really tested, so um, uh, that one never really saw action proper. Um, an earlier weapon uh, was the Cockatrice, uh, this was a lorry-based flamethrowing weapon that uh, ended up uh, seeing some action. It was issued to the RAF for um, protecting airfields. Now you may think, why would you try to protect an airfield with a flamethrower? I mean, what, what good is that going to do against an aircraft? Uh, although actually, interestingly, a bit of a digression here, uh, earlier uh, um, flamethrower development was uh, developed for the anti-aircraft role, which you might think is rather odd, but think think of World War I aircraft made out of cloth, very inaccurate bombers, they have to come very, very low and they're not going very fast, so a flamethrower used against one of those might actually have been very effective, but by the time World War II came along, um, aircraft were flying much higher, much faster, and they weren't all made out of cloth, and so flamethrowers were pretty useless against them. But you could, the RAF thought, uh, usefully deploy the cockatrice in defence of aerodromes because what they feared was attack by paratroopers. German Fallschirmjäger might land actually on uh, your, your airfield and then try to secure it that way. So what you want is a rapid response vehicle. And it wouldn't have to be uh, a, a powerful tank like a, a crocodile. Some reasonably fast lorry with a flamethrower on it might do the job because when the Fallschirmjäger first landed they were just armed with pistols uh, in separate drop cans, their rifles and, and heavier weapons landed. So immediately on landing they were actually vulnerable and uh, they had to get to their um, those canisters and, and, and arm themselves. And if you could deploy a flamethrowing vehicle really quickly you could wreak absolute havoc, was the thought. Anyway, um, but that was an earlier weapon. Uh, the, the Churchill was a very... Well, one thing about the, the, the Churchill was it was actually an up-to-date tank. This was a frontline in-service tank. Uh, they carried on using them, in fact, until 1955. Um, earlier flamethrower tanks were often converted out of obsolete stuff. Well, what do we do with this captured rubbish tank? Well, we could turn it into a flamethrower. Uh, yeah, we could use it for that. Might scare the civilians a bit. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, but the Churchill was an up-to-date, still in-service, proper main battle tank. Well, I shouldn't call it a main battle tank. That's a modern term, but you understand. And uh, it was uh, still a gun tank. See, instead of converting the Churchill's main gun into a flamethrower, which is what uh, other flamethrowing conversions have, had, had done, they still had the normal turret on the tank with its normal 75mm gun that could still fire armour-piercing and very effective high explosive rounds, and it still had the coaxial Beza machine gun to rat-tat-tat away. Instead, it was the bow machine gun that was replaced with a, a nozzle for the flamethrower. And it was fueled not from a tank that was in the tank or on the tank, it was a separate trailer towed behind the tank. Which made a big difference because this trailer, often referred to as a Bowser, uh, well it was armoured, had about a steel, uh, about an inch of steel on it, so it was proof against um, bullets and, and strain mortar bombs and the like. Um, it, could, it could hold 400 gallons of fuel. 400 gallons, uh, and it had uh, five big, big, very high pressure uh, gas canisters. Uh, they used air early on, but uh, later they went over to using nitrogen, which was very slightly better. Um, and this thing had a hell of a range on it. Now, 
Uh, to give you some sort of comparison, you have to understand what a, a man portable flamethrower was like. Now, the standard uh, man portable backpack type. Um, Flamethrower for the British Army was called the Life Boy because it looked a little bit like a, a life, you know, like that donut shape, and uh, that had in it four gallons of fuel, and um, the propellant took ten seconds to squirt it out. So you had ammunition of ten seconds worth of of flame, and you had four gallons, four gallons, not four hundred gallons. So you had one percent as much fuel and uh, you had 10 seconds uh, of, of squirt time, whereas the Churchill had 80 seconds, yeah, 1 minute 20 seconds of squirt time and 400 gallons, so every second of squirt was an awful lot more gallons. So you had an awful lot more fuel going for an awful lot longer and an awful lot further. Now, the, Ger the standard German flamethrower of World War II uh, had a, a range of just 27 and a half yards and carried only 2.6 gallons of fuel. Um, so uh, up against a, a, a Churchill crocodile, um, it, it was just not a fair fight. Now, what was the range of the Churchill crocodile? Some of you may be confused about this because, uh, like me, you might have looked up in a few different sources and been given quite radically different measurements. I think now, having read lots of sources, I've sorted out. The maximum range was 150 yards. Um, but actually that's not a very useful figure. So yes, if you pointed it uh, up and squirted it on a, on a flat field uh, on, a, on a, a calm day, it would go 150 yards, but you would never attack a target at 150 yards because at the end of that, that uh, rod of flame, there would just be just, just flames licking the target. And that's not what you want. You want to be deluging that target with, with burning liquid. And to do that effectively, you want to be at 120 yards. So 120 yards, um, in battle reports I have read, that's the uh, distance at which they, they opened fire, more literally than normal. Uh, that's when they, they started squirting at the enemy at 120 yards. 80 yards gets quoted quite a lot, and 80 yards, so far as I can tell, that was the ideal range. So you get to 120 yards, you'd start uh, uh, flaming the target, but you'd carry on advancing to 80 yards to get to your I ideal range. And from that range, uh, it was accurate enough to squirt into a trench, flood the trench with, with burning liquid. You could squirt it through the, the letterbox, the slits on a, on a bunker very accurately. Um, I, I read that it was usually the second squirt that did that. The first squirt, they, they would snake around a bit and find it, and then, okay, the smoke would clear, okay, got it, and the second squirt would go accurately straight through that slit and flame the enemy. Oh, by the way, this uh, reminds me of something that um, I used to hear as a child a lot. There was a, there was a fact that I was told about flamethrowers uh, that I was told this so many times, and it was one of those things that were just, was just accepted as true, which was that uh, flamethrowers didn't kill men in bunkers by burning them, but by using up all the oxygen in the air, and the men in the bunkers died of asphyxiation. As an adult, I have never read this anywhere in any source, and I do find it a little difficult to believe. Um, Usually, if you, you burn up all the oxygen in the air, uh, this, this creates a, a partial vacuum that sucks in more air through the firing slits and so forth, and maybe the back door, if you have the good sense to open it, uh, of, of the bunker. And they weren't airtight things. So um, I, I don't think that's true. I don't think men died of asphyxiation because of flamethrowers. But I'm not saying it's impossible. It's one of those things that got said a lot, uh, but I, I know of no evidence to back that up. Anyway, I'm getting off, um, uh, I'm getting off the, uh, the point. So uh, you, you can squirt this fire for 120 yards, effectively, far further than anything the enemy is going to uh, have, in, at least as a flamethrower, coming the other way. Now you may say, well, surely the, the Germans had 88 millimeter flat guns, and they would they could knock out a, a Churchill. And yes, you're right, uh, they did, and, and and the 88 definitely could knock out a Churchill. Um, but the Churchills were, uh, the crocodiles were not attacking where there were 88 millimeter guns. Um, for one thing, an 88mm gun is a very difficult thing to hide. This is one of the big problems with it. The, the flak gun version of it was very tall with a big square um, barn door-like uh, shield on the front of it. That was very difficult to hide. And before an attack would go in, the Allies would have consulted aerial photographs. They would have scouted it, perhaps sent out patrols at night. They would have got information and, and it's very unlikely that they'll be attacking somewhere that had an 88mm and they didn't know about it. So. If there's an 88mm, you don't send tanks forward against it because they'll get knocked out. But if you are the Germans and you're defending and you've got a load of uh, tank-proof bunkers and highly tank-resistant trenches and loads of men with panzerfausts, which are little, just in case you don't know what a panzerfaust is, there you go, little, little hand-held anti-tank thing. Uh, so um, 
uh, if you've got loads of men with Panzerfausts, you're, you're fine against tanks. The tanks can't hurt you from a distance, and if the tanks try to overrun your position, you've got Panzerfausts and you'll blow them all up. Um, but Panzerfausts have quite a short range. Um, uh, but normally, of course, this wouldn't matter. Uh, but if you are up against Churchill crocodiles coming at you, then the range on them is quite significant. So if you've got one of the early Panzerfausts that had a range of about 33 yards, uh, that would be fairly useless against the Churchill anyway, because it wouldn't get through its very thick and good armour. Uh, but if you're using one of the later uh, ones, which in 1944-45 would have been much more common, that had a range of 66 yards. And yes, could, if you got a, a really good hit, nice square on, uh, could go through the front armour of a, a Churchill just and still have a little bit of oomph to do some damage on the inside. So yes, you could, but how do you get to within 66 yards? Don't forget, that's the maximum range. You want to really want to get a fair bit closer than 66 yards. So um, how are you going to do that? Well, you're not going to fire from your bunker, are you? Because um, you've got a, that biconical shaped charge on the front and you've got a, a tube behind on the Panzerfaust, which is full of propellant and a little sight and trigger mechanism on the top. So you tuck it under your arm and you point it looking at, uh, along the top of the sight and on a little mark on the bomb itself, which was the foresight, and then you would trigger it and hope. And vroom, the propellant would go off and the, the, uh, the, uh, the bomb would shoot forwards and the little fins that were folded up on the inside of the tube, they would flick out and guide it like a dart onto the target, all going well. Uh, you would not go flying backwards from the recoil because this was like a recoilless rifle. Um, the back end of the tube was open, uh, so it wasn't closed like the breech on a cannon, it was an open tube. So uh, when the propellant went off, it went shooting backwards and shooting forwards. It would propel the, uh, the missile to the target that way, and that would then compensate for the, the recoil. So uh, the man wouldn't be thrown backwards, but he would be in tremendous trouble with all his fellows in the bunker if he shot it from within the bunker, because that back blast was powerful and wicked. And if that, the back blast itself didn't render everyone uh, useless uh, within the bunker, including the operator, uh, then the whole bunker would be filled with choking, blinding smoke that would render them all useless uh, anyway. So you, you don't fire one of these things from within a bunker. And firing one from within a trench was pretty tricky, so you'd have to get out there. Now, did I mention that the uh, the range of the crocodile was about 120 yards? So you've got something with a range of 66 yards, maximum range, and it's got a, a good effective range of 120. How are you going to get to within range? You're going to climb out of your trench, go through your own wire, stepping through that, go tip, tip, tip through your own minefield, and then uh, just hope that they don't use the flamethrower against you? If anyone's looking out the front of their tank and they see a man coming towards them with a Panzerfaust, they're bound to object. Oh, well, clearly what you do is you go around the side. Go around the side. Okay, well, um, typically, of course, there won't just be one uh, tank attacking you, there'll be a few. So the next one in the line, that will get you. But all right, you, you attack the one on the end of the line. Okay, so you, you run around the side of that. Um, Oh, but wait a minute, uh, don't you think that it's likely to have some infantry escort support? All those hedges and, and trees uh, back there, don't you think there's going to be one guy with a Bren gun who, seeing a German running around the side of one of his tanks uh, carrying a Panzerfaust, is going to object with a Bren gun? Yeah, okay, good luck getting into position to th around the side of a, of a crocodile as it's advancing on your position. But let's say it's possible. Okay, so you managed to get around the side of, of the... Uh, uh, Churchill. So what, what are you going to shoot? Well, if you shoot it in the side of the hull, that's not going to do it a huge amount of damage because it's got about that much of spaced armour on it. But whoa, wait, wait. Tempting target. There's the Bowser itself. Okay. I'll blow that up and it'll a spectacular explosion. There's 400 gallons of fuel in that. Okay, so you get, with your explosive, not particularly accurate device, within not many yards of the Bowser. And you fire your high explosive device to make a hole in the near side of that Bowser, the other side of which is 400 gallons of sticky napalm-like fuel and five very high-pressure gas tanks. And if one of those ruptures, what do you think's going to happen next? Yeah, you're not going to want to be standing there, are you? Okay, so no, don't shoot a Panzerfaust at the Bowser. That's a really, really dangerous, stupid thing to do. So what does that uh, leave you? Ah, shoot the Churchill in the side of the turret. The Panzerfaust could definitely go through the side armour of a Churchill's turret. So, yes, that's the thing to aim at. The trouble is with turrets. What do the turrets do? Oh, yeah, they turn, don't they? Now, the, the, tur the turret on a Churchill was a fully operational, normal turret. And so it would, if it, anyone was seen coming around the side, they'd turn the turret and use the main gun and the machine gun. And maybe a, a, another neighbouring tank would help out. And, of course, the supporting infantry I mentioned earlier. So getting around the side of an attacking Churchill was 
near suicidal, uh, and so it tended not to happen much. So in fact, you could, in a well-armoured Churchill, advance on a German position, being reasonably sure that they don't have an 88mm gun, and that Panzerfausts are not going to do you in either, uh, and then you can start flaming. Uh, one thing they sometimes did was uh, a wet squirt. So they would squirt fuel uh, into trenches and uh, onto the, the slits of the, the various bunkers. And so the men in, inside would then feel, what's that smell? Ah, I'm wet. Ah, there's the smell of, uh, oh, they're going to turn on. The, am I going to run away now? Well, I suppose it is my duty to stand and fight, isn't it? You know, for the fatherland and that. Yeah, yeah, that's what I, I'm going to I'm going to carry on fighting and know they're turning on the flag. Do you know, I've changed my mind. You, you're going to run. If you are anything but insane, you're going to run. Yes, even SS fanatics, when soaked in fuel and given the options of burn to death instantly or surrender, generally went for surrender because they weren't complete idiots. Um, so uh, the Churchill uh, flamethrower has got tremendous uh, range. It's got uh, a, a tremendous amount of ammunition uh, to call upon. It's an extremely effective, perhaps the most effective ever, flamethrower. And um, I've read a report uh, that uh, looked at 31 attacks between June and October 1944. So that's the uh, uh, Normandy landings uh, and going inland from there. And uh, uh, not only did it report uh, an awful lot of success, um, but it, oh, actually, one thing, uh, one thing of it, it reported that um, if the front armour had been sloping rather than flat, uh, they, they estimated that uh, between four and six vehicles and eight to twelve lives would have been saved. Uh, but on the other hand, the same report said um, that the casualty rate was actually, uh, I think, not unduly high, uh, given that these were used right at the point of attacks against some of the toughest nuts. Uh, they, they were fighting constantly, heavy fighting, close fighting for five months. And that all said, the casualties that they, they, they sustained were actually pretty light. Um, now, one thing about the Bowser uh, was that it uh, had, had a, very, a very interesting coupling, actually. The coupling had to be able to um, uh, yaw like that relative to the tank and pitch like that and roll relative to the tank as well. So it could move in all three directions uh, while still supplying fuel to the, uh, the tank. Um, uh, and the Bowser could be jettisoned from within the tank. You didn't have to get out the tank and uncouple it. You could actually just pull a lever in the inside of the tank and jettison the Bowser. Uh, now, of course, one of the reasons that uh, this feature was installed was that they thought that people wouldn't want to go into battle permanently fixed to this, this bomb behind them. It might make them extremely nervous and they might think if there's any possible threat to the, the bowels, they might just think, let's just abandon ship in case it, it blows up and catches fire. Um, now, in fact, uh, when they were asked, how often does this actually happen? Uh, the answer was they were very seldom jettisoned, actually, and only there are only two reported cases of the Bowser catching fire. Um, and when they did jettison the Bowser, it was almost always, if you like, for good reasons rather than bad. It wasn't because they felt they were in danger. It was because they'd used up all the ammunition, in, they'd used up all the fuel in the Bowser and thought, well, we may as well just jettison it now. It'll, be, it'll just make us lighter and faster. Uh, uh, oh, and it was generally also to carry on the attack. They uh, perhaps had cleared out all the trenches and they wanted to then cross the trenches and carry on, keep the momentum going, keep the attack going and just carry on as a normal gun tank and it might uh, slow them down crossing the trenches, so they jettisoned it in order to do more fighting. Um, so yes, the jettisoning ability was used, uh, but uh, not, not uh, out of panic very often. Um, now, uh, they were used uh, in mainly in, on the Western Front in places like France, uh, Holland and Belgium. Uh, they were used a bit in Italy. They were destined to go to Japan, uh, but that never actually happened because of those two uh, atomic bombs I, I mentioned earlier uh, ended the war before they ever got there. Um, uh, they were used also not just in support of British attacks, but they were sometimes loaned out to uh, Americans uh, in support of their attacks. Um, and, and this report that I was, uh, I was reading uh, had loads of questions in which people were asking the people who knew, who were there, who had been using these for a long time, uh, does this work? Does, should this be improved? And most of the answers were, yeah, it's fine. The ignition system, they say, yeah, yeah, reliably, um, no one's reported any uh, problems with the ignition system. Yeah, the ignition system, oh, it should tell you how the ignition system worked. Um, you've got a second, uh, you've got the main fuel that comes from the Bowser that, that goes through the coupling, then down a pipe that goes down the back of the tank, then under the bottom of the tank, and then pop, pops up into the tank and uh, then to the nozzle uh, for squirting out of the front of the uh, machine gun, where the, the hull machine gun, sorry, where the hull machine gun would have been, the, the bow machine gun position. 
uh, which got converted. Um, and uh, then you had a separate system with another pump uh, bringing a thinner line of petrol from the tank's own petrol tank to just above the, the nozzle. So that would then have a second uh, nozzle spraying out petrol between two uh, electrical contacts. So there'll be a spark across there and that would be what, in, uh, what ignited the petrol, which then ignited the main fuel of the flamethrower. Uh, extra detail from you. Here are some, some pictures that I took of, of the system in, in Bovington that aren't brilliantly clear, so I'm not going to spend very long on them. Now, um, uh, so the, the, the yeah, so does the ignition system work? Yeah, the ignition system is fine. Can the fuel be improved? Would this kind of fuel be better? Would that kind of fuel be better? Would it be better if it were fueled this way? Would this be a quicker way of fueling it? And usually to these questions they're saying, uh, I suppose it could be improved, but you know, it's fine. The fuel is fine. It works. Um, there were just two things that they asked again and again for. More range. More range is good. Yes, uh, 120 yards effective is really, really good. Much better than any other flamethrower. But, but more range would still be really good. There was anything that can give you more range they were in favour of. And the other thing is, could we just use them in bigger groups? Now, looking at the, the battle reports uh, of the use in France and Belgium in 1944, I saw one action where 12 crocodiles went in together, uh, several actions where just one went in, but typically it was three to nine uh, was the, 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 the size of, of unit use, three to nine crocodiles in support of an attack. Um, now you could say that um, that was a bad thing because if you're the local commander you want to just overwhelm the enemy so if you could have like 24 that would be great they send in the, and, and the, the the british had enough crocodile conversion kits that the royal electrical and mechanical engineers the remi used to convert an ordinary uh, churchill into a, a flamethrower tank they they sent over 550 kits they, they could have had three entire regiments plus loads of spares um of, of crocodiles but instead they, they they parceled them out in these little penny packets and normally that policy gets um, uh, presented as a very bad idea. Uh, the, the, the more you, tanks you use, the fewer you lose, is, is one of the maxims that General Slim used. Uh, and yes, um, it, it seems to be generally true that if you can overwhelm the opposition, you, you, you uh, stand a better chance of winning. But thinking it from not the, the local commander's point of view, but across the, the whole of the, of the front, if you could penny pack it out these things and they were still working quite well, even in these small numbers, maybe this is an exception. Maybe it was actually a good policy to, to use these in small numbers in many places rather than in few places in large numbers. Uh, there you go, another one for the, the military analysts. Um, so they're, they're always uh, asking for that. Um, reversing, could, could, they ask, how difficult is it to reverse? And they said, well, it does slow you down, but actually reversing with one of these things is easy. So that if you have ever wondered whether you can reverse in a Churchill crocodile, well, apparently you can. It's a bit slow, but yep, that's fine. Um, now, uh, did they use, this is one of the questions, did you use the, uh, the turret in battle at the same time? And in the report, it said in... <laughs> <laughs> in very bold, large type, yes, always. So as they were going forwards using their flamethrowers, they, they were using the turret to full effect. That was rat tat tat with the machine gun and boom with the main gun uh, as well as, which was another reason why this tank was so flipping effective because you had two weapon systems. It had almost the entire tank plus the incredible effect of this flamethrower. Um, now, um, I suppose I should... Uh, say why, using facts and figures, this was so effective after I've talked to you a bit about my sponsor, Audible. Now, if you don't know what Audible is, it's a huge online website that sells audiobooks. And if you click on the link in the description, that's the easy way, or go to www.audible.com stroke Lindy Beige, or text Lindy Beige to 500, 500 then you can take advantage of an offer of a free 30-day trial and one free audiobook. And once you subscribe, uh, every month uh, you get another book and you get two Audible Originals. Audible Originals are things exclusive to Audible, not available anywhere else, which is why I used the word exclusive, so that was a bit tautologous. Sorry. Um, and, uh, and I noticed that they're, they're, they're pushing quite big names. Stephen Fry's name is on quite a few of these Audible Originals. Uh, so they're, they're pushing that quite heavily on the site. Uh, so these things... Um, but anyway, so books. Um, now, I was thinking, what, what book 
uh, would be particularly suitable to get. And uh, it got me thinking about the format of books, because how can you improve yourself? I mean, we, we read books in order to prove it, so how can you make yourself a better you? Well, you could be more familiar with the classics, like uh, Charles Dickens, for instance. Now, when I was at school, uh, I didn't do English, but a lot of uh, the people in the same year as me, they did do English, and the set book was Charles Dickens's Little Dorrit, which uniformly the pupils referred to as Big Dorrit. It is a daunting book. It's a huge, chunky, physical thing, useful in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but it's not the sort of thing you think, well, I'll just read that this afternoon because you're not going to get through it. But here's the thing. Charles Dickens didn't write it to be a book. When an artist creates a work of art, he knows in, in, in what form it's going to manifest, how it's going to be consumed, and so he creates the artwork to suit that manifestation. Now, Little Dorrit was actually written as a monthly serial. It was meant to be read in, in little, little bite sizes. It was consumed as, as a modern person might uh, watch a soap opera on television in episodes over a long time. Um, in Britain we have EastEnders and Coronation Street. In Australia they have um, Neighbours and Home and Away. And in America, all around, around the world they have these long-running successful soap operas. Now, if someone, even if you were a fan of one of these soap operas, if someone said to you, Here's the thing, and it's all of the soap opera from the start. You just look at it, well, I, I can't watch that, it's just too big. But you were never meant to. Charles Dickens didn't write Little Dorrit for, for, for someone to think, oh, crikey, do I have to read all of this? No, he wrote it as a monthly serial. So what modern reformat, because people today are not going to buy something as a monthly serial, that's not going to happen again, but what modern format suits these big classics? Well, uh, of course, with a lot of things. Watch the film, it's easier. And there have been five, yes, count them, five film adaptations of Little Dorrit. Uh, the one which I had a go at watching was the one starring Derek Jacobi, or as the Americans call him, Derek Jacobi. I think it's because they wanted to make him sound more like a Jedi. He does look a bit like Alec Guinness, I suppose. Anyway, uh, that was astonishing. Uh, five and three quarter hours long, and I watched the first part of it. It's, it's cut up uh, into two parts, and I thought, Whew, that was, that, was, that was good, but that was long. That was long, and I didn't watch the second half. But wait, audiobook! Yes, maybe this is the way to consume these things that were once, uh, these big classics that were once serials. Audiobooks you can, you can listen at your convenience whenever you like, uh, for as long as you like. Uh, yes, it's a, very, it's a very easy way to break something up into, into bite-sized chunks and you never have to get to physical grips with the, the actual weighty tome itself. Um, so, uh, there's an idea. And there are five versions of the, um, of the full thing. There are some abridged versions as well, but you don't want an abridged version, you want the full thing. And there are five versions uh, on Audible available of Little Dorrit. And uh, you can click an, on, on the little uh, bits on the screen and they will play you little samples of the particular reader reading a bit from that book. So you can hear what their accent like, what their delivery is like, and you can pick the one you like. And it, if you later change your mind, you can actually swap. Um, and uh, you may decide, for instance, that you want uh, Sinead Dixon's version. And, and she takes her time. She spends 36 hours and one minute reading her way through uh, Big Dorrit. Uh, whereas uh, Anthony Ferguson, he fair hairs through it in, in just 31 hours and 48. Uh, anyway, so you can you can pick the one you want. So why not go to www.audible.com stroke Lindy Beige or text Lindy Beige to 500 500. <gasps> Phew. Okay, now back to crocodiles. So I was saying that it was super duper effective, but wouldn't it be better if I you know, put some figures on just how effective it was? Right. Well, imagine uh, you might say that the most effective weapon was uh, my, uh, the machine gun in World War II. And yeah, yeah, the machine gun was an extremely effective weapon, very, very important. But the thing is that actually both sides had machine guns. So if this side's got machine guns and this side's also got machine guns, then how effective they are cancels out. Uh, if everyone's got it, then um, it doesn't actually turn the tide of a battle. Now you could say, oh, but this side had slightly better machine guns than this side. And maybe arguably some nations were using slightly better machine guns than others. But again, if they both got effective fit for purpose machine guns, it's not really going to be the decisive battle uh, winning tool. Um, but what if one side has a weapon and the other side doesn't have that weapon or a near equivalent of it? How often does the side with the weapon win? Because if it's, if it's skewed 
significantly away from 50% of the time, you might think, oh, that's a significant result. If you look at loads of battles, then uh, if it's you know, 55, you know, 60% chance of winning a battle if you've got this weapon and they haven't, but everything else is equal, then wow, that would be a pretty effective weapon. Well, in actions involving the crocodile, oh, and I should say, just to make it even more amazing, in actions involving the crocodile, there were almost always attacks. Uh, it, it's not a defensive weapon, really, the, the crocodile. It was used in attacks, and attacks against particularly tough targets, well-fortified positions that couldn't otherwise be taken easily. Attacking is always, always more difficult for reasons which I hope are reasonably obvious, but I'll give you a few reasons. Um, uh, well, the defender just has to sit there, doesn't have to move around, which makes organisation uh, much more easy, whereas the, the, uh, the organisation of getting all your various units to move and support each other as they move forwards in attack is more difficult. Um, the defender gets a victory even if the attacker um, is, is, is rubbish. It still, it still counts. We, if we are still in position uh, at the end of the battle, then the defenders have won. Uh, now, of course, a lot of uh, attacks, uh, where the, they just dissolve because they were shambolic. Um, someone arrives too late, someone turns up but with the wrong ammunition, someone else turns up but he's still insisting that he's, his orders that he was given last night are the order he's going to carry out, but everyone else understands that the battle has been changed since then and there's the raging back to uh, Br Brigade HQ, hang on, who, which of us has got the correct orders, and then someone's gone unsupported too early without the others, it's just a shambles, let's call it off. That would be notched up as a, as, a, as a victory to the defenders, even if the defenders didn't, didn't even know they were being attacked. They could just been smoking and playing cribbage the whole time. Um, attacking, you can't take your bunkers and your barbed wire and your mines and, and your trenches with you. You have to advance over open ground, drawing attention to yourself, not in nearly such good cover. Um, and if you're firing, you're firing either in a hasty position or on the move, so it's going to be less accurate, whereas the defenders are, are firing from prepared positions with a, a, a big store of ammunition that they can have with them. Okay, enough already. Defending's more easy than attack. So, they're attacking, and they're attacking particularly tough nuts. In actions where the one side had crocodiles, the side with crocodiles won 90% of the time. 90% of the time. That is a staggering success rate. And when I've uh, read the action reports, of the unsuccessful attacks, uh, never has the crocodile been blamed. Always, it's bad organisation. Oh, uh, what I was talking about just a, a short while ago, the confusion amongst the attackers. Uh, some people have, th th no, we're in command of the crocodiles. No, you are. No, hang on, who's coordinating with the crocodiles? Sorry, uh, who's supporting? Uh, are we supporting from behind? Uh, they, they, they messed up and the, the attack got called off. It wasn't the crocodile's fault. It was that um, the whole attack was just a shambles and they called it off. So. Uh, the, the, the crocodile, it seems, was, was innocent when it, of, of the defeats, and it won 90% of the time. But I can go further. I can go further. 50% of the time, it encountered little or no resistance. Um, there are uh, accounts of uh, times when uh, the crocodiles were actually out of range, and because of the particular lie of the land, they couldn't get to within range. Uh, but uh, still, the enemy surrendered anyway. In one action, 150 Germans surrendered to a crocodile that was out of range. Um, sometimes, as soon as the flames get turned on, uh, white flags appeared uh, across the, the enemy lines. Now, I've been reading this book here. It's called War Games. It's uh, by Leo Murray, and I enjoyed it a lot. And it's about military tactical psychology. Uh, the things that increase uh, soldiers' effectiveness in the field and, crucially, this is a central argument, uh, decrease the willingness of the opposition to fight. Uh, war, as, as Leo describes it, is something which has the objective of getting the enemy to stop fighting. Um, whereas a lot of people get fixated on, oh, it's about taking positions or killing the enemy. No, no, it's persuading the enemy to stop fighting. And the best thing is, well, you could just all just go home and the war could just fizzle out. That would be quite nice because peace is good. Uh, but also surrendering, that's good. Now, if you've got a weapon that causes people to surrender, rather than carry on fighting. That's a particularly good weapon. If you can get people to surrender, then indirectly they persuade subsequent people to surrender. Because if, if loads of men in your army surrendered yesterday, and the day before, and the day before, and then an attack comes and you, you, against you, you sort of now got an excuse. Oh, it's what people are doing these days. They're surrendering. Oh, it's an option. Apparently they treat uh, prisoners quite well. And uh, 
you know, the food that, the, that our chef in this unit comes up with, you know, well, we can't really call him a chef cook, even the cook's a, a, bit, a bit of a bit of a, uh, unwarranted praise. Uh, it's not so good. I, I, I'd rather uh, try out their cuisine, frankly. And so I'm going to surrender because it, it's, it's okay. Other people are doing it. So once, once you get this momentum of large numbers of people surrendering, then you know that the war, the end of the war is coming. So surrendering is great. They don't, you haven't seen them away from the position. They haven't fled and routed so that they can perhaps rally and fight another day. They're now out of the war forever. And by having surrendered, they're sort of acting as ambassadors to other people in that army to surrender. So surrender is good. And oh boy, was the crocodile good at getting people to surrender. Now, in the uh, in the between June and October, in the 31 actions that I was reading about, um, 154 men were burned to death by the crocodiles, and that's nasty. 154 men were burned to death. That's a, that's a grim end, which is quite regrettable. But the good news is, 5,425 men surrendered, which is just good for all the reasons I've described. Plus, of course people not getting hurt, which is good in itself, isn't it? So getting the enemy to surrender is, is, is terrifically good. And there was a particular way that proved very, very effective. And it used what was called, what, what is referred to in the, in the book War Games as advertising. Oh dear, yes, I did just do air quotes. I'll try not to do too many of those. Now, advertising in this con uh, context means showing the enemy what you've got, showing him the stick that you could beat him with. Um, so, the best way to use a crocodile, it turned out, was to use it in a way that was actually contrary to doctrine. What you were supposed to do was advance right up to within range, and now that you're within range of your weapon, you should start using your weapon, because what's the point of using a weapon before you're within range? That's just a waste of ammunition, and even with 1 minute and 20 seconds worth of fuel, you've still got quite limited ammunition, so, you know, so don't use it when you're out of range. Plus, um, the feeling was that sudden shock of a powerful weapon used nearby uh, had a bigger psychological impact on the enemy. But it turned out that maybe actually that sudden shock thing wasn't that effective, and not in the case of a crocodile, certainly as effective as long-range advertising. So when you were still out of range, you would turn the flame on and play it about a bit and show the enemy, we've got this. So that was, if you like, the stick. And there was a carrot as well you could offer. There is an alternative. How about surrendering to these nice, friendly, escorting infantry? So, as long as you had uh, the, the stick, the flame, and the carrot, the people to surrender to, it worked extremely well. Um, and in terms of the number of people who surrendered, it, uh, you, you would get perhaps um, five people surrendering per man who got injured if you didn't advertise. So that's still a really good ratio. But if you did advertise, you got 27 men surrendering for everyone who got injured in the fight. So it pays to advertise. So show them what you've got and let them think about whether they you know, want to reassess their priorities as you continue your advance. Um, but sometimes um, there's something called weapon pull. Weapon pull is a psychological term uh, used by tactical psychologists, military tactical psychologists, which refers to the reluctance that someone would have to use his weapon if there's someone else nearby who's got a much better weapon. So if your side is attacking with these terrifying flamethrowers who are also spitting uh, machine gun bullets and high explosives and so forth, if that's going in and you're an infantryman with a rifle, you're actually less likely to shoot your rifle because you think, well, what's the point? They're, they're doing all the work. I'm, I'm superfluous, really. You know, they're going, and I can go, you know, who's even going to notice my rifle? I'll just stay here and the battle will probably be won without me. So sometimes, um, it, it was rare because they, they knew to escort uh, with infantry, but the, the infantry were also a little bit scared of, of these tanks because they were scary, fiery things. And what if one blew up? It might blow up in a more spectacular way than, than normal. So they didn't like getting too close to them. Um, but if you didn't have those nice, friendly, visible uh, infantry to whom you could surrender, then you're actually probably not going to surrender because you can't surrender to a flamethrowing tank. How do you surrender to the crocodile itself? Uh, this is a, a problem that, that they have with uh, Apache gunships in places like uh, Afghanistan today. So you may think, oh, 
Apache gunship. Brilliant, brilliant weapon. I mean, it's, it's so deadly. Yeah, they were designed for knocking out Russian tanks and they're really good at that. But um, for in Afghanistan against insurgents, it's not so handy because you've got this weapon. What do you want the enemy to do? You want him to uh, stop fighting, uh, run away, surrender. One of those things. They're, they're all good results, yeah? Well, he's not going to run away if you're flying around with a, a, an attack helicopter, is he? Because he knows as soon as he starts moving, you'll see him and you'll be very capable of shooting him dead because um, you're a running guy with, with a possibly armed... You're, you're dead if you start running away with an attack helicopter. So you don't. You sit tight. So the, the unit that's gone forward on the ground and has encountered the enemy and is now pinned down and has whistled up for support from the attack helicopter, the attack helicopter doesn't shoo the enemy away. It makes them go further to ground. Okay, so you actually make them put them more stubbornly in play, in place. And you can't surrender to an Apache helicopter, can you? How do you do that? So you've now got to carry on fighting. So if anything, you've made the the enemy more likely to carry on fighting, not only in the short term because of this particular action, but if you do shoot anyone dead, then uh, that's actually great for their recruitment drive and, and two more insurgents get created for everyone that you shoot with an, an attack helicopter. Plus, they actually think, actually even worse, drones. Um, dr there's not even a man in the drone. Uh, the man piloting the drone might be back home eating a hamburger in an office in, in America somewhere and he's going to be going home to his wife and kids later that day. Um, a lot of the insurgents would see the, uh, the, 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 the coalition, the, the Brits and the Americans, using these drones as cowards. Uh, and that actually makes them more likely to fight against you, more uh, likely to recruit more. So as a war-winning tool, the Apache helicopter is perhaps not actually all that good. Whereas a war-winning tool, in coordination with friendly, you can surrender to us, uh, plucky Brits, infantry escorting the... Uh, crocodile was an extremely effective war-winning war-winning tool but if you got too close the psychology flipped here's the thing when you're right up close to the, the the tank the only rational thing that the guys in the tank can do is try to kill you because they don't want you getting around the side with the Panzerfaust or stuffing grenades up the exhaust pipe or throwing bundles of grenades onto the engine deck and that sort of thing uh, so they've got to try to kill you in which case you flip into fight mode. So when the, uh, the, the, the the crocodiles were right in amongst the enemy, they would actually then fight, fight a very tough, bitter action. Uh, still, they tended to win. Uh, I read of one, for instance, when a load of uh, SS uh, ambushed some uh, crocodiles, four crocodiles, in a wood, and the crocodiles had no infantry support. So the crocodiles immediately went into, we've got to fight as hard as we can mode. And uh, they killed 25 Germans and took five prisoners. Um, so it was still a victory chalked up to the, uh, the crocodiles, but it was a much a bloodier, nastier, more vicious action. Um, the carrot and stick technique was enormously more effective. And um, I've talked about weapon pull. So if you're being uh, attacked by some weapon that, that's just bigger and more terrifying than anything you've got and you've got no direct reply to it, you are 30% less likely to, to fight at all. So there you are in your slit trench with a rifle, Panzerfaust, whatever, grenades, and some crocodiles come towards you. There's a 30% greater than normal chance that you're not going to just fight at all. You're just going to sit tight and hope everything just goes away. Um, but with the advertising, with the showing them in advance, this is what's coming at you. Now, how would you, how would you like to react? There was a reported 90% we weapon pull. The, the enemy troops were 90% less likely to continue the fight and actually use any of their weapons in a fight. So this is a tremendously effective war-winning tool that skewed battles to an extraordinary degree. Um, and uh, it, they, they maintain momentum as well. As I said earlier, they would often then jettison the bowser and then carry on. Uh, maintaining the momentum of attack. They didn't take the position after a really hard fight and then think, oh, phew, they're all so psychologically so exhausted, they're just going to have to just stop there and gather the, themselves together. It was such an easy victory quite often that they could carry on and push the front much further back than otherwise would have been the case. So it was a, a very effective weapon, absolutely across the board. And there are a surprising number that uh, still survive today. Uh, just researching on the internet in the last couple of days, I found that there are 13 crocodiles that still exist in the world and three, amazingly enough, that are still runners. They still actually go. I don't know if the flamethrowers still work. I imagine it'd be quite difficult getting hold of uh, all the, the, the stickies and napalm-like fuel for them and uh, uh, to get permission to use one. I imagine you'd probably have to fill in a form. <laughs>